one of the other jungle fever um, things I want to touch on to deal with the jungle fever scene too is um, that you know his part his his partner here um, almost feels responsible for him, and there's there's this great uh, thing that opens up, um, you know, through all of this that Troutman kind of teaches them to feel responsible for each other. And I really love how not just bonding, but, you know, they really don't want each other to die to be selected. And in the end, it really amps the game up from, you know, uh, you know, from going from a, what one would think is a non-end-of-the-world uh, a survival process to what you would um, the end of the world kind of feelings you would have on the battlefield in the real deal um, but what makes this cool is that the envelope is pushed to the point where uh, people people will lose their lives well they won't lose their lives but they're in the process of mindscape where they're ready to lose their lives for what they believe in and for what they want to do and you know they can't go back and you know once you pass that line there's no going back well you know how that goes so question number 13 there's a moment in Coletta's hunting <coughs> montage very amazing hunting montage uh, where he accepts death it's very Native American were you inspired at all of native lore pertaining to human and animal life being equal, um, it sure sounds like it. You know, because natives, you know, natives, you know, you know there was e equality. If, 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 a, if a native man killed a buffalo, they used all of the buffalo, every piece of the buffalo. Um, there was very much a respect. And in that respect, um, the buffalo was giving its life for the tribe, so that in the same exchange, if a man was killed, let's just say by a buffalo, a native man was killed by a buffalo, um, they would respect the buffalo because it was giving back. It was like a communal, um, you know, they were one with Mother Nature on a totally um, other level that no one, you know, today really, you know, partakes in. Almost spiritually, uh, I would say. Also, I love the father asking the son if he wants a cigarette. <laughs> uh, like, that would be the only moment a father would be lighting up to calm down and hand one over. I love it. The drinking, too. The father and son bonding in this scene is wonderful. Wallace writes, Yes, it's a Native American idea. But in general, I was thinking to the universal, worldwide version of the good hunter. Every good hunter in every country of the world loves nature and is extremely respectful of nature. Those who hunt as they were going to the grocery store are idiots, not hunters. Regarding the father-son bond, in the 60s, smoking was not a big deal. They thought booze much more dangerous than smoking. I used to both. Um, I used both to give the scene, the feeling, um, the feeling you had. The boy had just risked his life, and his father obviously feels guilty. So he breaks the rules and gives the kid something he really shouldn't, and it's a present because he feels guilty. Um, I love that answer. And, and going back to it, it's true. It was a very different time. It wouldn't be. Like today, like, you know, oh, I'm not going to give you the cigarette because it's going to kill you. Even though you almost died, um, there's still that double entendre of, okay, well, now I'm going to kill you some other way. But it is very true. In those days, it was a very different time. Uh, you know, I, I can remember, like, the days when, I, I can remember the days I could walk into a store, 13 years old, and buy a pack of cigarettes. I could buy, you know, uh... I could go to the store from my dad and get him a pack of cigarettes. I could buy myself a pack of cigarettes. I remember back then when um, you were allowed to do these crazy things that you were not allowed to do today. 
you know, and t time has changed. I also remember it being like four dollars back then, and not uh, four dollars and fifty cents, not the ten dollars a pack of cigarettes costs now. But enough about smoking. Let's get on to question fourteen. I also liked how Troutman was beginning to give them slack and leeway. Was it hard to get into the state of mind of his character, disconnecting from them because he could see his pride in them and neo-paternity, if you will? So Wallace writes, Nope, it wasn't difficult, and here uh, follows the reason. The Special Forces Selection programs usually start slowly and then turns to hell for safety reasons, because by doing so, those who are really too weak will give up during the first and simpler tasks, and thus before injuring themselves. A selection program is a very dangerous thing, and it never goes from 0 to 100% in one day. Just to say, some months ago, a guy died during an SAS long march. Imagine that. And that touches back to what I was saying before about wanting to do something so much that you give your body and your soul and your mind and and your belief system, and, and you know, you have to think it takes a certain type of person to want to go from, I would say, a humble man to a killer. And this book deals with that in a, in a light that I don't think has been explored very much in uh, any Hollywoodized version of a war movie or anything like that. And I think when you get down to First Blood, actually, um, we get the aftermath of that. So you don't even get that in there. Um, you know, that great thing of having the hero say nothing and have everyone talk about the hero. So that's very, very cool. Question 15. When Coletta passes out and everyone starts freaking and Ortega almost gets his tongue punched out, were you tempted to have Rambo join in that mini fight confrontation rather than just have him hold Jurgensen back? Wallace writes, laughs. No, um, I had no temptation like that. In fact, I was tempted to make him doing nothing at all because he was too tired. At this point, they are all tired and out of their minds. And Rambo, Rambo's very young. He is still just one of the many and this is probably the coolest thing in my work because you know when you see him this way you are surprised by that and want to know how how he did become the real Rambo and this makes the reader go on and on very true you know we had this uh, conversation the other day me and Wallace about the tease aspect of this book which is that Rambo um, by the end of this book you're just starting to see just starting to see a glimpse, a glimpse of that Rambo from First Blood, from the ending of First Blood, and you're getting a glimpse of, of what this guy is, is, ready, is ready to uh, formulate. And um, I have to admit, reading this, I was thinking about this SNL skit the other day, uh, Orange Julius, where Sly, um, Sly is, uh, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, uh, I know it's in one of the last questions of the book, but um, there's a there's a part in the book where Rambo has to come face to face with, are you going home or are you staying here? Are you gonna, you know, are you gonna let us fuck you up until you're dead? Because you might not survive the training, you know, or are you gonna go home? And there's a a, a great skit called Orange Julius Saturday Night Live, Will Ferrell and and. Um, that other guy, I can't remember his name, uh, and, and Stallone, and they're at a computer store, and uh, Stallone's not in his right mind, and I think his name is Leon in this uh, skit, and he's kind of, it like almost like around that Copland era, that Copland acting, but at the same time, very kind of not there, like very innocence of youth, but not there. And uh, it kind of re it reminded when I saw that skit it it, it reminds me of it reminds me of um, of this book and it reminds me of the ending of this book and how uh, you know Rambo's in that mind frame where he's completely 
completely lost it, but he's not ready to give up. And I think it's really cool, you know, because when I, when I saw that SNL skit, I was, Saturday Night Live skit, I was so like, man, that's how I envisioned Rambo at the end of that book. Almost delirious, but um, the character in the SNL skit is just uh, light-minded, I would say. But his mannerisms and, and how he talks and how he, like, touches him himself and how he carries himself and how he's not there from time to time and how he doesn't really have anything. And um, I, I think, you know, Sly should definitely look back to that role for a feature film or for a future film, I should say, because his acting is just so... You don't see Sly like that. You don't see Sly like that. Even with Rocky, you know, Rocky was a slow guy and then a brain damaged guy. You don't really... You get a glimpse of it, but you don't see it. Freddie Heflin from Copland, you kind of get a glimpse of it, but it doesn't go all the way. This one, uh, this performance, um, even though it was made to be a joke, I took it very seriously. And I felt very serious about how... Uh, that's why I was in that scene. It almost made me want to cry. Uh, I think that's the key to any beautiful actor. And even though doing that on the spot, imagine that, doing that on the spot. You know, it's like three, two, one, go, and you have to nail it. Sly blew it out of the park. But when I, when I read the ending to year one, um, to the story side of it, uh, the novel side, that, that, came, that came up to me. Especially because this is the third time I, I've read year one. And the third time's the charm, and 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 just seeing this uh, this kind of uh, I don't know, it just linked linked to that in my mind. I just felt you know, I just felt really estranged by it. Uh, but it was a good connection, and maybe you know, maybe it was just timing or coincidence. But uh, that's how I kind of saw Rambo at the end, and I don't mean that as a joke. I mean that as like watch how Sly carries himself very broken, very unsure. Um, he doesn't, uh, he shouldn't be there, but he is there. And even though he doesn't have the tools to acquire what he needs at that point to continue, he's still there and he's still giving it his heart and he wants to continue. And for that reason, uh, like the Orange Julius, in the end of the Orange Julius, he gets the reward. You know, the big Orange Julius reward, the dream come true. And uh, I think that's uh, a very good uh, analogy to this book. You know, just a very good analogy to uh, the selection process in the end, how Rambo excels and uh, is accepted. And, uh, and keep in mind, Rambo in this book is the youngest out of all of them. And keep in mind, Rambo doesn't get that much book time. You know, he doesn't get that maybe, what, 30 pages? Uh, the rest of it is everyone else. So Rambo is kind of like a cornerstone in this. Uh, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not Rambo Origins. So uh, anyway, let's move on now. <coughs> so question number 16. Um, in Mesner's case, as it is, with most of the characters, hold on, um, in the novel, how much did you focus on making them flawed? It comes across like how real men are flawed and make mistakes and have to live with the ghosts they create. <coughs> Wallace writes, that's a very interesting question. Yes, every one of them is more or less flawed in many ways. The only real regular guy is Coletta. Maybe I thought that in order to wish to fight Vietnam, you had to be flawed, but frankly, I don't know. It just tried to be... F I just tried to find the best backgrounds I could and the ones that fit more with what the characters were going to become. <clears throat> 